Catering Depot is a provider of quality modern commercial kitchen and food service equipment. With over 20 years of experience in business and partnerships with various quality brands spanning all over the world to provide the right equipment suited for today's modern chef. Brands such as Breville Polyscience, Roboku, Cooktech, Unox, Vito, Poshizaki, Santos, Newmacher, Osti, Excalibur, and many more. So whether you are looking for a piece of equipment to start your food business or restaurant, contact us for a quotation and we'll be happy to assist you. Because at Catering Depot, we provide modern equipment for today's modern chef. The key to success is understanding the subtleties of flavor. After all, flavors make the dish. From the tiniest pinch to the most generous dash, mastering it is what separates great cooking from good. It is also what separates McCormick from the rest. Ours is a mastery that the world can taste and experience. A mastery that empowers you in your culinary creations. With McCormick, you can wield the power of flavors like an expert. Experiment with a blend of earthy spices and savory meat broth. Marry the flavors over robust spices and aromatic herbs in a warm and hearty meal. Harness the explosive goodness of salty, tangy flavor bombs. Use warm, bold spices and herbs to add the unexpected to the familiar and awaken the senses with refreshing tropical fruity concoctions blooming with spices and herbs. Everything you need to create tomorrow's culinary masterpieces. Everything you need to always be plates ahead. McCormick.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope everyone had their coffee, tea, or breakfast this morning, and we have such a jam-packed day for you. Um, and pretty much we will start right now with invocation and then the anthem. Um, so again, thank you for joining us, and we are excited to get started. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord, our Heavenly Father. We offer you our thanksgiving. We thank you for everyone gathered here today to walk with you. May we ask you for your blessings and guidance so that the activities set for this undertaking be successful. We ask you to open our eyes to see the wonderful things from this activity. We ask that you open our ears so that we may retain the invaluable knowledge. Open our minds for us to think wisely. Put us with understanding, cooperation, and peace in fulfilling our responsibilities. Open our hearts so that we may receive your everlasting love. And open our spirit so that we may know that you are with us all throughout the day. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiliw, kailas ng sinahanan, alam ng puso, sa dikit mo'y buhay. Upang hinihinang, huyag ka ng magiging, sa manlulupin, di ka pasisigil, sa nagatak tutok sa simoy at sa langit. Again, good morning to everyone. I am Bea. I am the PR and Communications Manager of CCA Manila. And actually today I'm so relieved because Angela, you're joining me and you have been to around 20 plus regions of the Philippines. And I think there's no one more knowledgeable to join me today. Good morning. Hello, a safe and celebratory morning to everyone. I'm Angela Pompey. I'll be your co-host to kick off CCA Manila's milestone 25th anniversary. Congratulations first and foremost to the whole CCA team. We are live on Facebook and registration is still ongoing as I speak. So please do, do join us as I promise a healthy conversation with our esteemed speakers in a few minutes. Also, all registered participants shall receive a sil silver lining kit, which includes access to virtual events throughout the four day celebration, a copy of the digital cookbook, a copy of the recipes from the alumni cook-off, 25 ebooks from the CCA e library and a webinar certificate. So, you know what, I, Angela, I'm not a fan of rules, but as we always start a virtual or a Zoom uh, event, there are quite a few rules or reminders that makes everything a lot better for everyone. So I'll just read it out and hopefully everyone here is experienced with these reminders the last couple I guess it's almost two years. So to ensure the quality of video and audio, we uh, we have muted all participants, but in case you are not on mute, um, just double check there's a microphone and it has a red that means you're mute. And if you have a question, I personally love questions, so use our chat box. And you can also unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, our keynote speakers will will try to answer your questions during the Q&A portion. I actually don't think they will try. They will definitely answer your questions because they're very knowledgeable. And of course, tag us at hashtag CCA Manila 25 on Facebook and Instagram. And lastly, we value your time. So we will keep the virtual event within the allotted time and avoid Zoom fatigue. I hope everyone will be hungry after. That is my personal goal, yeah. <laughs> okay, so before starting the dialogue, we first would like to acknowledge the following people. 
a big shout out to the CCA employees, the keynote speakers, the CCA students, the CCA industry partners, non-CCA students, employees from private and public sectors, all sponsors for the four-day virtual event, and the sponsors for the kickoff event, namely McCormick Culinary, National Blade Works, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and Catering Depot. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of activities throughout the week, right? Yeah, I mean, I am quite excited for this. Like, it's about a week long from November to December. And I just wanted to share what is going to go happen. And I hope everyone will enjoy each. There's always an event for each person. So today we have a kickoff. And it really, it's a lot of talks and fresh perspective on Filipino gastronomy and cuisine. And then my um, personal favorite is storytelling through food because like you Angelo I love um, reading and writing and I think food has such a strong power in this and the third one is I think this is either a favorite or a lot of our students get scared of this it's clash of clans <laughs> it's an annual culinary competition and last year we did a food drive for typhoon typhoon ulysses but this year we're bringing back the competition which it basically means that we have a uh, cheese category plant-based meat main course seafood and such and the, the students are always put on heat and put everything that they've learned into practice and be interesting to see what they've learned in the last couple of months and um, everything that has gone through. Then of course, the CC employees have their own virtual gathering to just celebrate the tenacity and um, the enthusiasm they still showed even during the pandemic. And of course, we have a day of food demonstrations. A lot of our alumni are putting their own twist or sharing a Filipino recipe, whether traditional or modern. And lastly, we have a digital cookbook that about 25 recipes from all our um, alumni, such as, I think I saw calamansi cake, adobo, of course, you can not have a Filipino cookbook without adobo. So that is pretty much what's going to happen. Okay, so the first day of activities, which is today, uh, we're there will be a lot of notable things happening. Um, day one includes webinar talks, a chance for our guests to ask questions to our esteemed panel, and the launching of CCA Manila's Filipino Culinary Arts Program, which I'm very much excited to learn about. Okay, so before we kick things off, um, we wanted because this, uh, this day to be educational, informative, and also interactive. And so we would like to ask everyone a quick survey, the answers of which you can type um, and share in the chat box. Okay, for our quick survey, the question is, if you have a foreigner friend who is planning to visit the Philippines, what local dish would you make him try? Or another way of putting it is, if, you, if you're planning a potluck party, what traditional Filipino dish would you contribute to the spread and why? Again, please share your um, answers in the chat box. What would yours be, Bea? Okay, so you know what? It's always been adobo because, okay, I had to feed about, let's say, 150 Bhutanese people. But I, I think when you're going to feed Filipino food or your own food, you should always check their preference and then try to match it. So, for example, in Bhutan, they love chili. So I tried to make uh, gising gising and Bicol Express. Uh, mm. But I don't know. How about you, Angela? What would you do? I feel like you would be an expert at this. No, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm all for representation and regional food um, is something I've strongly been advocating, not just with my book, but personally, mm -hmm. but also personally. So I would perhaps serve them a uh, dish from Mindanao. For example, my favorite, Yula Itum. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a soup served to the royals and it's cooked with burnt coconut. Now I would serve that because um, that's part of the country that's perhaps, that perhaps least traveled to. And so uh, for the guests to be able to try something from the South, this is what I would serve them. That is, and always have to have a good story, I think. Cause like when I introduced Gising Gising, I was like, oh, it's like, uh, it means 
literal translation of wake up, wake up. And then immediately they're willing to try it. And I think it's mm. always good to have that um, background or context of the food. People are um, going uh, very interesting. What are some of the answers? What are some uh, of the answers of our? Uh, I of saw our the, the usual culprits adobo, sinigang. Sisig? Yes, <laughs> sisig. <laughs> Matrabaho yun, but I would say. Oh, from Arlene Hardenera. Wow. I saw sinigang na miso, kare kare with bagnet. But okay. adobo seems to be the most popular answer right now. It is the most popular <laughs> dish of the year. <laughs> so, um, bulalo. Bulalo is good. Pinakbet as well. And mm. okay, there are so much actually. Um, hmm, how Just about keep dessert? typing your answers. How about oh, dessert? Ma, what would you serve? We have I mean, a you... lot of... Well, we have a lot of kakanim that I'm so in love with. Like biko... Um, sapin sapin, too big. And so that's something that we can be really proud of. Yeah. I saw that you had this mochi like, uh, was it Masi? Masi from Cebu? It's Masi from Cebu. Yeah. And funnily enough, it's a, it's a driver, a taxi driver who introduced it to me. So um, from, the, from the airport to the hotel, we were caught in traffic and someone was selling Masi in the street. So the driver told me, sir, you want Masi. So, parang, oh wow, this is like mochi and there's a peanut filling inside. Yeah. That's, is that the most unlikely um, situation where you've discovered a dish or a dessert from a taxi driver? Or is there any other strange place where you're like, okay, <laughs> I would have never found this through this? Well, when I traveled, I'd, um, I'd visit a lot of Karinderias and that's where I mostly um, discovered a lot of these um, lesser known dishes that are found in my book. There's always a secret in the current day. I feel like everyone has like a special dish or something different that they do. Of course, people are your chef JP Sarsa. Yeah, that is a staple. Pinakbet Elokana top with Bugnet. Okay, now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> this is making yeah. us hungry. <laughs> so just keep posting your answers, guys, and we'll get back to those later on. How about potluck? Is there any difference of like what you would serve? Like, you know, potluck is such a different kind of setup, right, Angela? It's like uh, it has to match. When you do potluck, you're not sure if it's going to match everyone's dish. Exactly. And what's good with potluck is that you can, um, you can um, showcase whatever dishes are, you know, are always put at home or served at home. Like you're like I I will serve my mom's like caldereta or my mom's letra flan or my lola's um boquillos yeah something to showcase what I grew up eating. I saw that those are your three kind of like roots of how you understand Filipino food. Mm, so growing up, that was my idea of Filipino food, and then it became wider. My knowledge became wider soon as I traveled around the country. It looks like everyone is very hungry. Dinugan <laughs> on the morning. I, I, Dinugan and Puto has a special place for breakfast for me. I won't say no. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Caldereta for potluck. Good choice, Jojo. <laughs> oh, wow. Chicken lollipop. Okay. <laughs> okay, so shall we get on with the meat of the program? Yeah. Okay, so to get things started, I would like to ask Dr. Veritas F. Luna, Chancellor for Education of CCA Manila, to take the stage and give her opening message. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Mainit na anniversary to all. Greeting everybody. Okay, so thank you for giving the floor to me, Angelo and Bea. No? Nagutom ako dun sa mga answers ng ating <laughs> participants. No? Okay, to kick this off, I would like to greet our CEO, Ms. Baji Trinidad, our distinguished uh, keynote speaker, Congressman Toff de Venecia. Magandang umaga po. Our distinguished speakers, of course, we have the presence of Professor Emeritus Dr. Mike Tang, Mr. Ige Ramos, Ms. Nicole uh, Ponseca, and of course, uh, Angelo and uh, Bea, and we also have our culinary direct director, Chef Philip Golding. Of course, our advisory board members, our alumni association 
President Chef Sandra, magandang umaga po sa inyo and our academic industry partners, guests, faculty, and students. Isang mainit at maalab na good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Kasi ano po tayo ngayon, eh, uh, global, no? we have uh, participants coming all the way from US, from Dubai, and many other places in the world. So together with our managers, we have uh, Chef Jasper Versosa, our program manager, Ms. May Pas Pasha, our sales and marketing manager. Of course, Bea Trinidad is here with you no, in, as a facilitator. And of course, our event program head, Ms. Jessa Cristobal. We welcome you all to this kickoff event of the CCA at 25 activities. Now, we have a long, um, many days of uh, activities, no? And hope that you will join us, no? So, uh, why do we need to celebrate? No, what's so important about 25? No, aside from being the pioneer in the industry, uh, I would like to boast that the recognition of CCA's excellent programs, as evidenced by the numerous partnerships that we had with reputable academic and the industry institutions, our ACF accreditation, the impressive student education and training outcomes that we have experienced, and of course, the numerous medals bestowed among our students, alumni, and faculty in international culinary competitions. And we also uh, need to celebrate because we have to recognize the recognition of being a leader and trailblazer in the Philippine culinary education and training sector. So uh, we have introduced innovative and relevant programs uh, to the industry. And most of our programs are actually infused with the spirit of entrepreneurship, environmentalism, sustainability, social responsibility, and the promotion of Philippine cuisine to the world. We also celebrate because uh, we are, we have to thank God, you know, because we are able to provide nurturing and holistic student faculty and staff development programs. We have in industry approved facilities and we have current culinary technologies available for learning. And we are able to maintain a robust networking program for our students and our alumni, not only as students, but likewise in their lifetime career journey. So we have the House of Spies, our CCA Alumni Association, and we also have the ACF Manila. And of course, most importantly, we celebrate and thank the Almighty God for sustaining us to keep our learners' culinary passion aflame. You know? And this makes them want to cook for the world. So in short, we celebrate culinary leadership and at the same time, thank the Lord for the many blessings. You know, uh, our president, Mom Annie, as we fondly call, call her, you know, laments that many institutions have copied and duplicated what we do. And I said, you know, Mom, Okay lang po, Ma'am Annie. That's what leaders do. They serve as models and as torchbearers and leaders. We first see what's ahead and often they get scorched. But it's okay. That's the role of the leader. And today, after 25 years of pioneering professional culinary arts in the country, many culinary schools and programs have mushroomed. And again, we say, it's okay. Look at where where it brought our foodscape to. Look at the opportunities that CCA has created for our families, communities, and our nation. So we celebrate that. And of course, CCA Manila will not be where it is today without the help of many people and groups who trusted our brand. We have academic institutions like the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, the University of Asia and the Pacific, and many others. We have industry partners TESDA, the general community, the many career development partners. I saw that Rose Dapos has joined us today. And they have assisted our students to get into or to realize their dreams of internship and jobs. And most importantly, the thousand of, uh, thousands of parents who sent their children to CCA to fulfill their culinary dreams. Maraming, maraming salamat po. We could not have done it without you. So what's in store for the 25th year of CCA Manila? 
we will continue to offer programs that are responsive to the times. You know, this pandemic has really brought us so many lessons and we will always bring these lessons with us in the next years to come. You know? We will continue doing partnerships with academic industry and government and the civil societies. We will support TESDA on the review and updates of, your, of our uh, trade regulations. We shall launch uh, the Filipino Culinary Arts Program. You know, we will offer this in uh, the first quarter of 2022. And hopefully we will work together with TESDA to create this as a certificate of competency program. And hopefully this will uh, produce a pool of uh, skilled cooks and chefs no? who can, uh, who, when they leave the country, they will have the Filipino uh, skills in culinary arts. Then we also will strengthen our faculty culinary leadership development programs no? because you know our faculty will be the frontliners for our culinary education programs. And last but not the least, we shall support SKIPA on the promulgation of a Filipino gastronomy policy in the creative industry. So let's move on as a kickoff to the 25th year of our beloved school. We have invited today notable speakers to share their views on on issues that beset our Filipino gastronomy and heritage. Hopefully their sharing would stimulate more interest to push for the promotion of our own cuisine internationally. So thank you dear speakers for celebrating this auspicious event with us through your talks. I also would like to now take the moment to congratulate CCA Manila, the faculty and administration, the staff, our CEO, Ms. Baji Trinidad, the school founder, Mom Annie Guerrero, for the outstanding work and vision that keeps this institution relevant, vibrant, and alive. To the CCA students and the alumni for continuing to live by the values of the school and making us all proud. We all look forward to more years to CCA Manila. Cheers to CCA Manila. So once again, I welcome you all to this momentous event, CCA at 25. Magandang umaga, magandang gabi, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Bea and Angelo. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Thank you, Dr. And we appreciate and acknowledge for all the contributions of PCA to the industry and to the country. Okay, let's start. So we are very lucky to be joined by such a celebrated roster of um, speakers today. But we are just as equally fortunate to be joined by respected figures in the industry to introduce each one of them. I would like to call on Ms. Marinella Trinidad, CEO of CCA Manila, to acquaint us with the first keynote speaker. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Angelo. Good morning to everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Congressman Tof de Venecia. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the Ateneo de Manila University and successfully completed a public leadership program from Harvard Kennedy School. He was also the former lifestyle editor of Chalk Magazine, as well as the editor and columnist for Philippine Star, uh, Star's Youth um, section for 13 years. At present, he is the representative of the 4th District of Pangasinan, as well as the deputy majority leader in the lower house and the chairman of the Special Committee on Creative Industry and Performing Arts. Today, we are very much honored to have him share something meaningful with our CCA community that will no doubt inspire us to take our cuisine forward. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Tok de Venecia. First of all, I would like to thank Ms. Jessica Cristobal, Dr. Maria Veritas F. Luna, and the rest of the Center for Culinary Arts Community for giving me this opportunity to speak in this kickoff event for gastronomy and heritage. Furthermore, with profound joy, I convey my cordial greetings and felicitations to the Center for Culinary Arts as you celebrate your 25th anniversary today. As lead convener of the Arts and Culture and Creative Industries Block of the 18th Congress, or ACHIB, and the Chairman of the Special Committee on Creative Industry and Performing Arts, I'm honored to take this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, food. And what a better way to talk about food with the best people in the industry, our very own local gastronomes, chefs, 
culinary artists and food lovers alike. I know this has been a long-standing statement, but the fact remains that food brings people together. And I find that there are so many ways in which this is true. We catch up with friends over food, whether that's updating each other on our lives over a long lunch, or inviting the fellas over for some home-cooked food and maybe a bottle of wine. Beautiful romances start with first dates over dinner, families celebrate birthdays, graduations, and anniversaries at their favorite restaurants. Whole communities come together to celebrate their heritage over traditional foods at food festivals. In almost all cultures around the world, sharing a meal is a common theme, and how we socialize with others and cooking for someone is a way of showing love and appreciation. We love to share our foodie finds with others, recommending restaurants we've discovered to both friends and even strangers. Who's ever eaten at a restaurant and thought, my parents or partner or besties would love this place. I must bring them here next time they're in town. I pretty much do this in my district in Pangasinan more often than not. I know that when I've dined and tried something utterly delicious, I've wish that I was sharing that experience with my loved ones. And is anyone else's phone full of pictures of either food you've snapped to send to someone or food that someone else has sent to you? The vast number of food-centric Instagram accounts and online bloggers are a shining example of how much we love to share what we're eating with others. A few months ago, I was perplexed yet excited to chair a series of congressional committee hearings talking and discussing key issues and opportunities in food and gastronomy, as well as the state of the sector. For many of us outside the food and beverage, and understandably so, the concept of gastronomy was a foreign idea. I admitted that I only got acquainted with this word at the start of the pandemic, and throughout the hearings when our resource persons, both from the public and the private sector, we're mapping out and identifying the stakeholders and firms that may fall under creative industries. I have learned and appreciated so much about food and I couldn't agree more that local culture is becoming more important due to the increase of competition between tourism destinations. We learned that gastronomy plays an intensely important role in culture because not only food is significant, to a tourist experience, but also moreover, the fact that gastronomy has become an important source of identity evolution in postmodern cultures. Nowadays, we are confronted with food and culinary arts in every shape continuously. But when did the first restaurant open its doors? Why and how did gastronomy as we know it today evolve into a mass and capital-oriented industry? I personally grew up in a gastronomical environment being raised in between pots and pans, I was always fascinated by food. It's an industry that will always exist because eating and drinking are basic needs that have to be satisfied. To which degree one is willing or interested in satisfying it is the other question. How and why are eating habits constantly changing? What are the factors that influence them? How does food identify a community? These were the questions that resounded all throughout our congressional inquiries. I also learned that our population is constantly growing, but our resources are limited. A challenge that has to be taken care of, addressed, and awareness has to be created. That is where the private sector, including the CCA, comes into the picture, and I am one with your efforts in advocating the underlying importance of the food and beverage industry and its passionate and creative stakeholders like yourself. All throughout the hearings, I have realized that the food you cook and prepare doesn't just tell the story of your country's diverse history or how and why that particular food was invented. It tells stories of families. For example, when recipes have been passed through generations of farms or hacendas have been part of the same family for many years. Maybe a vineyard now grows its fruits and vegetables organically because a previous family member's health was affected by pesticides. Maybe a father taught a son how to fish and now he makes a living from this. Food can also tell the story of a community. For example, marketplaces are often the center of a community where people not only shop for food and support local entrepreneurs but also meet up to eat, drink, 
or just even chat. People who live alone and sometimes feel isolated may use their food shopping as a reason to get out of the house and socialize. Uh, of course, not during the pandemic. And when markets have places to sit and enjoy a meal, it's even better. Markets are full of people with fascinating stories. And food is, of course, at the heart of all of this. I'm not the most knowledgeable in terms of being a cook, but I love the fact that there is this awesome creativity that will surround the kitchen. I know it's a great feeling when you put together a bit of a random meal from ingredients in the cupboard or local farms and it, that it actually works. Even more so, I love going out for food when someone else has gotten creative in the kitchen. Whether it's a fancy tasting menu, a modern twist on a well-known dish like adobo, the new craze of vegan junk food, or just a beautifully presented plate of classic Filipino or international cuisine, it's all good in my eyes. In the same way that we appreciate music, poetry, fashion, or visual arts, I honestly believe that food should be appreciated in the same way. It can be just as much of an expression of creativity. That's why it belongs under the umbrella of the creative industries. The bonus is that we get to enjoy eating it, share it with others, and feel happy and belong to a collective identity. Thankfully, we are at the cusp of pushing government efforts in strengthening the food industry, like creating value chain and food mapping initiatives with certain government agencies and private sector for us to be able to know where we are at now. And I appreciate the unending support and collaboration from CCA and Dr. Maria Veritas F. Luna. I congratulate all of you in this wonderful event that makes us work together in giving our many creative industries, including gastronomy, and especially, of course, our creative gastronomes, as well as the food they are identified with, the support and recognition they deserve. There will come a time that our country is at the forefront of diversity in terms of the food that we create. In the near future, we will definitely cook for the world. Congratulations to the Center of Culinary Arts, and I hope you enjoy the celebration. And always remember, hashtag the future is creative. Thank you, Congressman Toff, and know that we are at arms with you in all your cultural efforts. How, how was the talk, Bea? You know what? I personally like the beginning of uh, starting out that food can spur either romance from a first date or it can celebrate <laughs> a festival and just shows that food is so diverse, Angelo. I mean, it's there's so much to unpack. We have mm. a lifetime to do it. I, I like that you pointed you out that I like that they pointed out that food has a story and that it can determine our identity. And that more than that, um, he, he mentioned about um, food security, which is a very important issue we are encountering right now. Like for an agricultural country, how come a lot of people are hungry? So this is something that I believe Sina congressmen are working on and I'm excited for, for all their projects. Yeah, and there's so much room to be creative and that all the projects that they'll do it will just spur more of a food revolution around Filipino food would be just amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talking about gastronomy and our roots, I get the privilege of introducing our next guest, who happens to be a very good friend too. Um, Mr. Iguer Ramos is an award-winning book designer, food writer, virtual artist, and independent scholar. He runs the Republic of Taste Food Network, a platform for his publishing, book design, and independent research project in edible design, comparative gastronomy, food history, anthropology, and public policy. His latest, his latest book is the English version of Dila at Bandila, which just won an award, by the way, the search for the Philippine national palate. <clears throat> this year, he published Appetite for Freedom, the recipes of Maria Y. Rosa, with essays on her life and work. Please welcome Mr. Iguer Ramos to give a talk on pride in our gastronomic roots. Hi, Angelo. <laughs> good, good morning. Is it morning? Morning. Uh, morning. Hi, how are you? Hi, Bea. Hi, Tawi. Uh, it's really nice to see you here today. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, wait, uh. How many participants do we have now? 179. OK. 
Okay, wow, that's a lot of people. So good morning to everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> this is so exciting. I'd like to congratulate uh, <clears throat> CCA for um, uh, reaching a milestone, 25 and 25th anniversary is no, no joke, especially in, um, in a volatile um, industry like culinary arts, especially education. So I really uh, love to, uh, you know, like uh, I'd like to send also my love to Mam Ma Annie Guerrero. I miss you so much. The last time we saw, uh, I saw Mam Ma Annie was in Lourdes, actually. And um, okay, so I'm quite, uh, I actually prepared the, uh, uh, is it possible to, uh, no, to share my screen? Yes, no. sir. Okay. This technology is really, you know, killing, <laughs> killing me. It's a killer. My God. Okay. Oops. You know, I've been, we've been rehearsing this, you know, so I don't know what's happening. Um, okay. Ah, there you go. Oops. Okay. So, can you see the screen now? Clear? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. So, um, once again, good morning. Finding pride in our gastronomic roots. Okay, um, as a food writer, like uh, Angela and I are, uh, have the same career path. Um, well, I, I started as a, um, a, as a food writer for, uh, for a Filipino tabloid called Bandera, and which I'm very, very proud because it's one of the first uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, food column uh, written in Filipino. This was about like 10 years ago. And, um, and then from there, I, I graduated as, a, you know, I started as a graphic designer and then a, um, a consumer uh, art director for a consumer service publication. And then eventually uh, editor-in-chief for a, for, a, for a supermarket magazine. And the journey, you know, like I discovered so many things where we get our, our information on food. So normally we get it from consumer service magazines, cookbooks, newspapers, uh, specialized uh, food book, um, uh, academic journals. But then again, uh, as you can see in this quadrant, I sort of divided where we get our information for food and what are the functions of uh, food, food literature and food writing. So most of us are familiar with uh, food as entertainment because this is like one of the first things that we uh, see and understand, like uh, watching celebrity chefs on TV, on YouTube, food bloggers, and you have the influencers and content creators. And then from there, we have uh, food as a source, source of uh, knowledge. And you have, you know, like food historians and food columnists. Um, we read it on specialized cookbooks or food books. And then you have food as social status. So you have all these like, like uh, high-end um, content creator that pr promotes a food. And then um, um, it, it's... Um, it's some sort of like a, um, a differentiation or market segmentation we're in. Okay, this is us and this is you. And then of course, like one of the most important thing also to, to understand, um, and uh, there are now people like food activists and food anthropologists, food scientists, who makes food as an agent of social change or agent for social change. So it's very, very interesting where we get our information no, about food. Okay, so as, uh, <clears throat> so as a food writer and like Angelo, no, like Angelo is a food, food writer, he promotes food as well. No? So, um, or us, you know, like everybody's basically a food critic, you know, like, because of Instagram and, and, and the social media, the advent of social media, everybody became a food critic. 
But for me, I uh, how do we judge our food, no? Um, <clears throat> this is how I judge my our food, no? Uh, basically, I use uh, Franz Boas. You can Google him. He invented the concept or the theory of culture brill, or viewing culture through a lens or cultural glasses, no? So it's very, very important to judge food without um, including our own biases, no? I mean, it's okay to have your own biases, but you have to look food on how people or, or the maker or the creator of food created it for you. So in my culture lenses or culture brill, uh, these are the variables, no? So you have geography, technology, ingredient, and ethnicity. And then when you put them all together, let's say, for instance, ingredient, and then you shine it with geography, you will find terroir. And then uh, you have geography and ethnicity, you find community. And then combining technology and ethnicity, you have trade. And then technology and ingredient, you have culinary. And then from that, the culinary terroir community and trade actually constitutes gastronomy. So in between these smaller lines are the most important things because these are the spaces. These are the food spaces. Like for, <clears throat> for example, uh, this particular space is where food is studied, observed, tested, and empirically, tested empirically and scientifically. So that's basically the school, no? And then here uh, you have a space where food is cogitated, codified, created, cooked, and consumed basically um, a space where you actually partake of food from carinderias to ambulant vendors to restaurants. And then this particular one is a space where food is weighed, displayed, exchanged, and sold as a community is market. And then this particular space where food is foraged, cultivated, nurtured, and grown is basically your farm and your, uh, <clears throat> uh, your, the sea, the river, and then the, the different sources of food. So as culinary students, I think uh, you've already studied this. No? So these are uh, when you judge food or when you write about food, you have to know the basic taste. So I don't have to discuss the basic taste anymore because I'm sure you're, you're, uh, you're already familiar with it. But of course, I can add the spiciness, astringency, and then one of the most important thing that um, we sort of forget is olio gustus, no? Yung olio gustus is actually the taste of oil, like uh, the taste of olive oil, the taste of coconut oil. And this is like a very, very important um, basic taste that we have to consider all the time. And then of course, like you have um, the flavor, the fullness, thickness, smell, aroma, and then the palatability. Then of course, like you have to understand also the how we accept food because external environment, the food culture and habitat and the mood and the physical state of the diner actually plays a very important role in how we perceive and taste our food. Now, with the basic taste of sourness, sweetness, saltiness, bitterness, and umami, how then can we put, you know, the Filipino taste? No, that's why. Um, let me put it this way. Um, I could actually, um, let's say, um, I always tell uh, culinary students, especially here, you know, in the Philippines, to to really understand first their their own taste before embarking on the cooking of other people. Let's say, uh, the, uh, let's say for instance, um, before you learn Japanese, French, Philippine, uh, Japanese, French, uh, Italian cuisine, you must understand first what you cook at home or what Filipino food is all about. Because it's so different, our food is so nuanced. Um, and um, how will you pigeonhole very unique Filipino taste in the, the five basic, uh, 
face no let's say for instance ano ang lasa ng raw fish no nung nung kinilaw where do you put it uh, is it between sweetness and sourness how do you uh, describe the taste of alagao or of the dakta or pig's blood or or yung rendered oil from chicken skin with achuete the taste of bagoong patis with calamansi and chili so these are the things that you really have to consider because you have to have a baseline of um a baseline or a what i call uh like a taste what do you call this um uh, you have to build up a vocabulary of taste or a taste thesaurus in your brain no? to be able to really understand what taste is all about okay now how we eat normally kasi, no, um, rice is the canvas uh, for the chromatic eaters no so filipinos are basically chromatic eaters and this is how we normally eat our food so rice is basically the canvas wherein you paint your you use the ulam to paint the colors and the texture no and this is how we normally eat and actually um on the top photos you have uh, the tagalog pinakbet with dangit and then and then um these are like actual photos they're not staged and then you have like a, a boiled fish like tinolang uh, isda with rice and then uh, this is like pinangat na sapsap with with dulong and uh that's how we eat no so there, there's like a a uh, it's really embedded in our dna and then i soon discovered that um around maritime southeast asia they eat the same you know they eat we eat like them no this is like a picture from from Borneo, from um, and then from Sulawesi, and in Gorontalo, in the different parts of uh, maritime Southeast Asia. Now, we go to codified knowledge and assumed knowledge. No, so um, uh, Tawi earlier discussed uh, new programs like the Philippine Culinary Arts Program in um, in uh, in CCA. No, so <clears throat> of course, you know. Um, the French codified their knowledge, uh, their, their uh, culinary knowledge uh, earlier on, like more than 200 years. That's why you have the terms Julien, Vichy, Brunoise, uh, Matignon, etc., no? Chiffonade. And because of that codified knowledge, they were able to preserve their food. No? Unlike in the Philippines, we only have assumed knowledge on how we prepare our food. No? I mean, we're a very, very young country. So that, um, and um, now, you know, like as uh, Angelo would know this, as a cookbook author, it's very, very hard to, to really write about Filipino uh, cookbooks because all we have is um, uh, traditions or recipes passed on orally. In other words, niluluto, tinitikman, kinikwento. So now, how if you're going to produce let's say a cookbook that's intended for foreign readers how will you describe how to cut sitaw or ampalaya or the, the sayote or the papaya in tinola because i would interview uh people let's say karinderia cooks let's say parang uh paano po pinuputol ang papaya sa ginagamit niyo sa tinola Ang sasabihin lang niya, ah, basta yung, yung puputulin mo lang ng pag ganon, pag ganyan, at, you know, at, uh, at uh, basta yung pang tinola. So, <coughs> this assume knowledge, it's kind of difficult because uh, to be able to express or articulate our menu, our food to other people, we have to be precise. That's why measurement and I'm not saying standardization, but there should be a codified knowledge of our cuisine. And that's your problem now. That's not my problem. <laughs> okay. So um, another one is to, to measure, to replicate, repeat, and recreate. Let's say, for instance, if you're going to cook pork adobo, um, 
this is actually a uh, a screenshot of a pork adobo recipe written by Maria Y. Orosa in 1932. So if you can, if you look at the, the basic recipe, uh, the ingredients, one kilo pork cut to pieces about two inches by one and a half inches, one head garlic, 40, tea, four teaspoons salt, one teaspoon black pepper ground, one teaspoon lard, two cups water, half cup vinegar. This is pork adobo in 1932. What's the missing ingredient? There are ingredients that's not included in our present adobo. Well, later, I'll, um, um, there's no toyo uh, and there's no laurel. So how then we can, I mean, this, this particular adobo is not forgotten and very, very few people write it, no? So if you notice, I put a happy birthday uh, score on the side because to be able to replicate a recipe, there have to be there should be a measurement. Like in music, there should be a basic melody and a basic harmony. Okay. And then, like in classical, like in and then this is like your classical music. And then when you want to jazz it up, you can change the notes, you can change the tempo, make it up bit. Gun then sa recipes. So you have like a classic recipe and then you can add things, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can actually play with it. So in my book, um, uh, my earlier book called uh, The Republic of Taste, uh, I tried to de deconstruct the Filipino adobo in six distinctive elements. No? And these are data sampled from the various places around, um, around the country and around Cavite. So these um, uh, distinctive elements are aromatic, salty and savory medium, acid, protein and vegetable, fat, and the state, no? whether it's flaky, dry, oily, or saucy, or soupy. So <coughs> you can actually, so in, in my opinion, um, this is just my opinion, and it has to be studied further, our taste, you know, the, the Filipino taste bud is, uh, is actually bordering on the sweet and sour, like adobo, for instance, you have to have like a salt and savory medium. At the same time, there's, a, there's uh, acid involved and aromatics. So it's not different from eating, let's say, sinigang or, um, or uh, paksiuna lechon, wherein you have, you have all these like different... Um, um, uh, elements no so this can be discussed further but uh, this is just the beginning of um, what can be done with our adobo now uh, the next 10 slides uh, the last 10 slides actually are, are are basically part of the research I've been doing for the last uh, 20 uh, 15 years so uh, I just discovered well it's not I discovered now, but like for the longest time, I thought palenque uh, and you know carinderias are public spaces as cultural hub. No, so they are virtually uh, there are virtual no not even virtual. They're they're an active cultural centers. You know, <coughs> they're active cultural centers. Um, these are um, active cultural centers that needs to be uh, discovered more and more. No? So these are the, the various documentation I did, um, of the ethnographic research I did in the last 15 years, interviewing uh, suka makers, butchers, kakanin makers, um, um, craftsmen, patis maker, etc. No? So you, have, uh, you can actually learn so much from them. Then um, Karinderia, um, uh, gastronomic ecosystems of taste, trust, and tradition. And, um, and if you go to a particular Karinderia in, 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 um, in, um, in a market or a marketplace or a small town, there's already an ecosystem involved. No? So you can actually see, um, you know, like all the, the food is eaten locally. These are hyper-local food traditions. 
passed on from one generation to the next. And um, how, how interesting, even before all this boom on, 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 on how food, uh, you know, like the, the consciousness on, our, on uh, how, we are, how we became conscious of our gastronomy for the last five years, they've been there all along, you know, um, doing all sorts of things, you know, um, um, and, um, and it's up to us to discover them because there's an entire biosphere ecosystem that, hap that happens in the Carinderia where, where, you know, like from, from gathering the ingredients and cooking them in a traditional way and serving them and then the kind of people who eats there. Then nature defines culture. Um, we have to discover and um, to, um, um, you know, to exper uh, experience and experiment with traditional ingredients. These are just some examples. And then living food heritage infrastructure, let's say for instance, uh, salt beds. Uh, this is one um, uh, example of living food heritage infrastructures. And this needs to be saved and, um, and uh, studied and patronized so that they won't perish or die. And then living food heritage methods like smoking, fermenting, drying, um, um, you know, uh, this needs to be studied well in, in, in the context of, um, let's say, what CCA is doing and, uh, or in other academic institutions. Because, you know, like even if anthropologists or food historians try to write about these things, they just remain on paper and it needs to be studied by culinary or uh, culinary practitioners. And then farm to plate eating, a culture of sustainability. So this is our like some of the things that we have to really um, uh, think about, about, you know, like how we support our farmers and how the logistics and distribution networks and uh, the value chain can be developed to be streamlined so we pay more farmers and less of the middleman to make it more sustainable. And then this is really, really important. This is really a challenge for the uh, young aspiring chefs because uh, chefs, um, they are the repository of heirloom ingredients and knowledge. And this is what the French were doing for the last uh, 500 years or, or more, um, or even the Italians. Uh, it's very, very important. The, the reason why their food is up there is because they really value their tradition. They really value their, their ingredients. And to this day, um, <clears throat> and then I think it's not too late for us to really, to really study our food ways, you know? I mean, they still exist. They're still there. And then the pandemic actually made them very, very, uh, you know, they made, they made it stronger and um, they're still there. So you really have to discover it for yourselves. And then this is what I do most of the time and Angelo, uh, documenting heritage foods and cookbooks. And these are the examples of the cookbooks I designed or produced in the last uh, 15 years. And then um, some of these uh, questions are actually in my book, my latest book. It's called Lasa ng Republika, Dila at Bandila, Ang Paghahanap sa Pambansang Panlasa ng Pilipinas. And um, <clears throat> it's written in Filipino. And uh, it, next month, we'll be releasing the English version. Uh, it's an updated version with foreword by Dr. Shalsita and translated by uh, Joey Bakiran from the UP Department ng Pilipino. So, uh, Dila at Bandila, search for the national palate of the Philippines. Okay, I'm not here to advocate a national dish. I'm actually anti-national dish. And I'm for the promotion of regional dishes. No? And then, of course, um, some of the historical cookbooks that I um, uh, produced this year is Appetite for Freedom, the recipes of Maria Y. Orosa with her essays on life and work. No? So, uh, so there, no? So 
these are the challenges for you, no? How do we save our food heritage and culinary tradition? I cannot just like answer it for you here in the seminar. You really have to discover it for yourselves because it's so easy. I mean, it's there, it's all around you. All you have to do is to wake up, um, um, be observant and, and, um, and, um, and uh, talk, to, talk to people, go to the market, visit farms, you know, and you will discover so much. And lastly, what is the value of studying food heritage? So with your background in culinary arts, I think it has to be buttressed by what you really are as a Filipino. Ano ba talaga ikaw? Like for, in, in, for instance, one of the very first things I, I studied, uh, I investigated was Cavite food because I'm, I'm Caviteño. And, um, and I, I thought Cavite was, the Cavite food was under the radar. So um, I, I made it parang uh, um, a mission to, to really discover what food we have and not think, not compete with any other region, but present the food as it is. You, know? you don't have to be apologetic about your food. There shouldn't be hiya. And just um, use the idea of culture brill. Excuse me. Uh, just use the idea of culture brill or viewing those things, those um, your culture or your food through the four lenses that I identified. But most importantly, uh, I leave you with this word. Um, uh, it's by Carlo Petrini. Uh, gastronomy is the only science that can measure happiness. So if you can measure your adobo, and if this adobo makes you happy, that's enough for us, diba? Right? So thank you so much for listening. And I think I overshot my 20 minutes already. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> My favorite takeaway is ano, that's uh, the taste thesaurus. I'm gonna use that now. Yeah, taste thesaurus is very important. <laughs> you have to build up like like if you're a writer, diba parang you have to 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 build up your vocabulary, diba. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tapos you have your favorite lines, your favorite statements, and then at the same time, you have now you have your taste thesaurus, diba Ang ganda. <laughs> There's actually but you know a what? book. Go, here, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. There, there's actually a book. I think it's called Taste the Source. It has a color wheel. And it goes through like a dictionary of every, <laughs> let's say, ingredient. There. That's the one. Oh, yeah. There you go. It is a good book. It's a very good book. That's the one. Oh, yeah. There you go. It is a good book. But I don't know. As, as food writers and book authors, also, we can only do so much to preserve our food, but the Perfect. rest of the country, I think, has to, you know, has to acknowledge and patronize our food so that it can last generations, right? Yeah. What, what do you think are the top three practical ways of really documenting, you know, like what you said, codifying as what the French did with Filipino cuisine? For you, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interview <laughs> Angela no, no. and Iga. I'm curious because you write about food and you research it so in-depthly. And there are people that, you know, they argue about adobo or how a certain dish is cooked. What do you think, like, let's say Filipino families can or chefs um, do to make sure that, you know, we are documenting in the right way? Yeah, okay. Uh, you can you can actually start with hyperlocal. But what I mean with hyperlocal, you can actually start with your own family, with your own family traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be a, you know, like a, a research on a national scope. All you have to do is like write down the recipes, the, the market list, the ingredient list that you buy all the time. Um, I, I was very lucky because I kept my mom's... Um, uh, diary and she has like market list you know like things that she buys from the market and there are certain things that I don't recognize anymore let's say um, uh, because she makes her own bagoong she buys angkak and angkak is like this red 
a yeasted rice. Um, um, uh, it's available from the market, and and it's very very interest, interesting how how you do it, no? Like like now, for instance, what I see now on on the 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 food the food world or the food universe, there's so, so much competition. Like like it's like it's like social media. I'm right, you're wrong, you know. And I think the most important thing here is to support each other. Let's say, for instance, I if I write about regional things or, or let's say for instance hyper local uh, food waste like Cavite. I'm willing to share it to anyone who asks for it. In fact, even before my recipes were printed on my own book, I already give them away to Angelo, to, to Brian Co, and they publish it first, even before I published it, because I want the uh, the things to spread, you know, like parang, um that's what's happening kasi now. Um we are when we discover things, we discover restaurants, we like inclusivity. We don't want to share it with other people. Or... So I think the most important thing to do, I mean, on your own, is just to discover your own backyard. What do you have in your own back garden, in your kitchen? Mm-hmm. What, uh, what did Lola cook? What did Tita cook? What do we practice? Uh, let's say Christmas. You know, Sometimes we get, we just get parang sidetrack or we, we we sort of like uh, what do you call this um parang because it's so normal it's so regular we think it's common actually it's not no ganun din yung ano like when when diba angelo when you interview people in um in the provinces they tell you uh paano ginagawa to bakit ay ano yung kinakain niyo Ay, wala. Simple lang yung pagkain namin. Ah, de, regular. Lag, laging ganon regular. Yun yung answer. Para, <laughs> ay, mga ano lang, ah, katamtaman lang, or ah, medium lang, or, you know, laging ganon. So, but actually, when you look at it, it's so special. It's so different from what we eat. Mm-hmm. So, ganon. So, like, like let's say, for, like, ano ho yung ginagamit yung sa, anong sahog sa langgonisa? Ay, basta yung ano lang, kinuko lang namin dyan yung mga dahon sa gubat, yung mga whatever, mga gano'n. So, and then you discover new things. And then, and and discovering new things is what makes it really, really nice and really, really uh, beautiful. So, so wait, guys, if you have um, questions for Ige or for Congress, Congressman Prof also, uh, please post them later because we're going to have a Q&A segment towards the end of the of this um of this event okay but for right now right now um i would like to express our gratitude to our sponsors mccormick culinary national blade works the uh, philippine daily inquirer and catering depot um here's a short video um presenting our sponsors I think before we just go quickly on the video, I forgot to mention that you can avail of the book by messaging library info at cca-manila.edu.ph. As you can see, Iger Ramos is a wealth of knowledge. He is like, uh, I don't know, I was, I was just shocked at how much we are looking at food at such a um, shallow way. So CCA students, faculty, alumni, and everyone else who's here, you can get a 20% discount until November 30, 2021. So grab your copies. I think everyone should read. Spend more time on reading than watching TikTok. Again, I would like to thank our sponsors who have uh, really helped us throughout this event and have worked along with us the last couple um, years. So Cravings, Catering Depot, uh, McCormick, Breville, Top Chef, National Blade Works, Scanpan, Ipalenque, Dairy Farm, Amala, Daimid Bidon, and Philippine Daily Inquirer as well. So now I would like to call Dr. Clara Maria Veritas Dunas to introduce our next speaker.
Good morning, everyone. It's me again. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. So Dr. Mike Tan is a veterinarian and medical anthropologist who has worked with community-based health programs since 1975. And he has been a university educator and administrator since 1984. He was chancellor of UP Diliman from 2014 to 2020 and is now professor emeritus and continuing to teach in, in the three universities, UP Diliman, UP Manila, and UP Los Banos. Dr. Tan frequently writes about food, nutrition, and culture, and is currently completing a project with Dr. Anita Harden of the University of Amsterdam. They're working on a book on how global cultural exchanges involve plant exchanges and knowledge about food, medicine, and clothing technologies. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Mike Tan. Greetings to CCA on your 25th anniversary with a very appropriate uh, theme of cooking for the world. My topic, I changed the title, tweaked it a bit to Filipino, the Filipino diaspora, heritage, and food. Let me start out by explaining that I am a product of the dual diaspora, the first of uh, Chinese to the Philippines. There were several waves. My grandparents came in early part of the 20th century. And then I also saw a second diaspora, that of Filipino Chinese. No? Not Chinoy, they're more of Chinese, migrating mainly to North America. So I saw the shaping of diets by both migration waves. No? I grew up with Chinese, mainly Cantonese and Hokkien foods, and the crossovers from the Chinese pancitero. No? Pancit comes from Piancit, which means ready-made food of uh, the 19th century because we had Chinese migrants selling food in the streets no? and into mainstream Filipino food. I'm sorry about the typo there. Uh, and then visiting relatives who had migrated to North America, I also saw the rapid assimilation into North American culture. For food, this meant more Chinese dishes at home and occasional comfort food, seek, uh, comfort food seek, seeking from Filipino restaurants which tended to be of the Perinderia type. In the early 1980s, I did my master's in Texas and I got to be close to Filipino students as well as the Filipino permanent residents there. We got to see home cooking away from home, especially weekend gatherings. It's interesting, they would be called barbecues, you know, barbecue get togethers, but there's a lot of Filipino food. You know. I had no memories of Filipino restaurants at that time. Then I would visit my sister who had migrated. And I remember many more of Chinese, Vietnamese, and Thai restaurants. Actually, the Vietnamese and Thai restaurants were often really Chinese. And there were frequent trips to Europe and the States when I started working. And I also studied in Amsterdam in the 1990s. And that meant exposure to another type of Filipino diaspora, the professionals, in North America, who tended to be very assimilated into the States, but white and blue collar Filipinos in North America, and especially Europe, who did, uh, who were more conscious about preserving Filipino foods. My memories of Amsterdam um, consisted of food. No Filipino food was uh, cooking my own, but uh, there was a great little tiny, tiny restaurant called Mango Bay in Amsterdam. Uh, with exquisite nouvelle cuisine. I, I, uh, I took the whole restaurant, which is really tiny, you know, for my dissertation party. You know, I had to have a reception. Another memory that uh, stays with me, Sunhead of 1617, which is a bed and breakfast owned by a Filipino married to a Dutch. You know? And it was a old house, 17th century, yeah, 1617, on one of the canals. You know? And what I remember especially there was the warmth and camaraderie and their breakfast. The secret ingredient, of course, was Filipino hospitality. Uh, Carlos Cecilio was the owner. He, I think he has returned to Cagayan de Oro, retired there. So we do a <coughs> fast, I'm sorry. We do a fast forward to our times now. And for this PowerPoint, I did some quick research and found 
my goodness, there's so many uh, restaurants now in, in the major cities of the world. But let me concentrate in the States. You have this review for Los Angeles restaurants. You have one for New York, which includes, of course, Purple Yam. You have for San Francisco and the East Bay. And the chains are there now, the famous Filipino restaurant chains land in Houston. So they name Max and Jerry, Jerry's Grill, and of course, Jolly Bee. Uh, of course, we want to be more cosmopolitan. We talk about Filipino restaurants in London and uh, quite impressive there. Here's a, they featured Romulo Cafe and the address is quite, I don't know, Kensington High Street, right? And you see it for, you see the others who are there, Josephine's, Mama San's Dirty Ice Cream, Kamayan's, or Earl's Court, no? so shall, and the restaurant called Oh My Kulai, yes, because I am a pesco vegetarian. And then I did look up Amsterdam because at that time, the only fine dining place in the 1990s was uh, Mango Bay. No? And apparently we have three now, maybe more. No? Um, it's interesting that Kalye is listed here yeah, it's in Chinatown. No? It's part of a an area which is really the address. In fact, is the Chinese Medish Practicum, which is the Chinese medicine uh, center. Uh, I checked again at random. There's one in Seoul, and they have a nice menu which uh, has Tagalog, English, and Korean. Little touches, I think, which will make a lot of difference. So the eternal questions that are asked, why isn't Filipino food more popular globally, especially when we consider that about 10% of the adult Filipino population lives abroad? You know? And some of the theories that I've heard over and over again from fellow overseas, uh, from overseas Filipinos and from a Quora post, you know, a recent one, long, long, long discussions, many people jumping in. You know? One is that we don't put up as many Filipino restaurants, meaning the upmarket fresh fine dining one as the Chinese Thai and Vietnamese do. I have a question though, you don't have that much fine dining either with the East Asian and Southeast Asian restaurants. You know? uh, one thing I've heard is our food is too brown. You know? It's all soy sauce down. And that our food is just not healthy. Too much salt, too much sugar, too much fat. Lahat na bawal, too much. But here's an alternative view, which uh, came out in an article in 2018 written by Julia Melcher. No? Um, and this is a direct quote. Filipino food is the original fusion cuisine, a mix of Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Western, Pacific Islander flavors. I like the way she describes it. She knows her history because I just finished a recent, recent research project looking at plants. No? And our exchanges go way, way back to the sixth century with links between our part of the world, the Philippines, and South and West Asia. No? So we, we've been, cultural exchanges have happened for a long time. So it's not surprising we do have fusion cuisine. Uh, and may I add that part of the cultural exchange, it's, it's a two-way thing. No? And we did leave our mark as well. Uh, for example, tuba no? is still sold in Colima, Mexico. No? And it is from the Philippines. It started in the Philippines. No? Uh, Dr. Gideon Lasco, who is roaming Latin America these past few months, no? he took a picture here. No? And the sign there, it's too small, maybe you can't read it. It says, Tubero de Colima. And uh, tubero there does not mean a plumber. It means someone who sells tobacco. You know? And uh, this is a it's a it's a hot day. And uh, Gideon said people actually buy it for the equivalent of something like a dollar US uh, for a little taho cup you know, of tobacco. That's in the middle of the day. Let's go back to Mesher's article. She she actually counters this argument that uh, food is Filipino food is unhealthy. She says Filipino food has no dairy or glutton, which makes the cuisine friendly to restricted diets. Oo nga, no? It is eaten family style with heaping plates of sharing dishes, which actually is very healthy. There's been theories that the Mediterranean diet is a lot of sociality involved. No? Uh, Filipino food uses vinegar instead of Western sauces full of sodium and fat. Ayan. Uh, she's throwing back that argument about our food being brown and unhealthy. And while our dishes are pork heavy, seafood and tropical fruit are made into light dishes that are far from bland. And it is full of acids and sweetness more than any other cuisine. Something to think about, something to build on. 
So what what might what might we need to do? Yes, I agree. Put put up more Filipino restaurants, but I hope they reflect our wider spectrum of Filipino food. We do need more research and publishing of regional cookbooks like any seasons seasons na naimas of Filipino food. Igay Ramos is a fellow panelist today. Uh, is Republic of Taste for Cavite Cuisine. I just had to take a picture of my copy together with the wrapper, which I never threw away because I think a lot, we have a lot to learn from Ige you know, on packaging. And uh, it's really branding you know, the way we, that's where we might need to put in a little more effort. And let's expand the, op the options. We need more production of regional recipe books. You know? Uh, I'm sorry, more production of regional recipes. Now, for example, just let's look at Sinigang's many variations. Now, the Ilonggo Sinigang Kansi uses budalo. Uh, even more important are the varieties of souring agents. And of all places, now, this is a blog about trees in the Philippines. And uh, the one who produces this um, had a very good post on the souring agents of Sinigang. This is what he has listed. And I did a little more research uh, because I'm sending this out to you. You can look at it in greater detail. Uh, a lot of these plants are actually not indigenous to the Philippines, but they are now part of our life today. You know? So instead of just some palok, we have calamansi, we have bayabas, kamyas, karmai, which I have not tasted. But the one is one of my favorites. No, this comes, uh, it's Panay Island, that's that where it's most popular. No? Libas, I have not seen either. The readers of that blog spot also sent in their uh, what what they're using. Alibang Bang is mentioned, no? and uh, apparently it was used by the Bataan Death Marchers. No? Uh, and an Iloilo reader from Iloilo actually sent in more labog, bilang bilang, pitada, pahu, santol, green mango. Uh, and two readers, of course, commented, this is excellent information and not the packet kind. I, I uh, cringe when I see all these uh, sinigang na in packets. No? But I'm going to say some good things as well later. And oh my gosh, I'm sal salivating. Which takes us to the hugot here. What, what can we learn from all this? We do have a wide variety of just for sinigang. No? So much that uh, needs to be exchanged among our different uh, regions no? and science can actually more allow us more innovations. So we understand that souring comes from acidic ingredients no? in specific parts of the plants, no? and the potential for a wider market is there if we would just learn, for example, that drying goes a long way. No? Uh, when I love going to Chinese groceries or whatever city I might be in the world, no? and you find all these dried stuff from China, and that is part of uh, food heritage as well, which we need to build up. I did not mention here, I think I erased it. Um, we know about the latest in one of the restaurants here is watermelon with beef you know, as another type of sinigang. So we just need to be bold in experimenting. Uh, we can certainly present to the world our kinilaw or our kilawin and Ami Besa and Romy Dorotan of um, Purple Yam in their book, Memories of Philippine Kitchens, says that uh, reminds us that the equation there, if you have a raw main ingredient, which can be not just fish, but meats, uh, even coconut beetle and shipworm, you know, plus a souring agent and the condiments. You know. The focus is on vinegars. You know. We have all kinds from coconut, from sugarcane, nipa, sinamak, you know. Puri. It's this variety which uh, the world looks for uh, in our, our now very cosmopolitan uh, milieu. People want to see that in foods as well. And we know, of course, to neutralize the fishy odors there, we have uh, lansa neutralizers. But Tanis is Baltinog. I, seem to, I remember seeing this in the Marine Science Institute's uh, garden, which was started by the late Dr. Gomez. No? I didn't have time to take a picture of that, of that little shrub, I think. No? And then there are others, there Dungon, uh, Pungango, I am not familiar with this. No? And Bakawan, of course, is Mangrove Park. No? My favorite is Tabon Tabon, na, which is from Mindanao. It's a little tree there, which I have never succeeded in, in uh, planting here in Manila. It 
doesn't seem to survive. No? But here it is, the brown one. It looks a bit like Chico, but inside it's completely different. This is from an overseas Filipino blog site which shows how they yearn for this. And the citrus, there's a name for it which I cannot recall either right now uh, and which I could not get to survive either here in Manila. No? But uh, it's a very, very different concoction when you think about the uh, kinilaw there. So, ano ang hugot natin dito? Do we even know what we have? All the stuff I've been mentioning, we might know what we have in our region, but we're not familiar with those from other parts of the Philippines. And I think a key here is to innovate in terms of processing and packaging, because if we want to go out into the world, we have to have these condiments, we have to have these sauces out there. And I remembered, and I looked it up in 2009, there's an article about uh, an entrepreneur who wanted, who had bottled Tabon Tabon, but it does not seem to have prospered. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I would love to buy the Tabon Tabon because I, I'm able to buy uh, Batuan, but not Tabon Tabon. Okay, we might want to learn from the example of Sri, Rat, Sri Rachi. I'm sorry, I uh, can't pronounce the word here, which means rooster. Now, this is the Vietnamese sauce made, made from red chili peppers, garlic, vinegar, salt, and sugar. Simpling ingredients, but they are able to put it together. And here's the history of Sri Rachi. You know? David Tran was a Vietnamese immigrant to the U.S. And he was homesick. He was longing for this sauce and decided to make his own. And he started by selling from a van. Now his company, Hui Fong Foods, is a multi-million dollar earner. And his uh, hot sauce has been imitated. Uh, there are a lot of other lookalikes, but this is the original one. I haven't seen this in the Philippines, but there are other brands as well. This is from his website. The versatility of sriracha is what we have to learn from. It's a dipping sauce. It's a marinade it's used for soups and stews and eggs and cheese and even for Bloody Marys. No? Uh, that is the secret. No? And there's much more. Our heritage foods and heritage recipes. No? There is a journal article, very serious, no? on upland rice var varieties and with the potential of $2 billion a year, we can just get it developed. No? This is from the site of the International Rice Research Institute uh, talking about heirloom rice. No? And these are the ones that are exported now to the States. No? Uh, there is the Slow Food Foundation based in Italy, which has a Ark of Food. No? It has a site called Ark of Food, like Noah's Ark. No? And there's a substantive, substantive list of Filipino uh, heritage foods there. No? And they actually break it down. You'll see there as, as in Tibuok, no? which is from Bohol. No? And I just saw a very interesting video about how difficult it is to prepare as in Tibuok. No? And it is available here. Uh, Mama Sita has set the pace with their variety of uh, packaged foods. And this is where I say that's fine. We, we need that as well. We're going to go international, but whatever we can have fresh, we should aim for the fresh ones as well. Uh, Ritual.ph uh, also has a very good selection of heritage foods. No? For example, Kalinga powder, which was had rave reviews in, in Gourmet Magazine. Um, and of course, let's not forget the growing trend towards healthy foods, especially the plant-based ones. So I'm very proud to be affiliated with a school called Kwangming College that is preparing. Now, these are just drafts, a Mabuhay vegetarian recipe book. No? Here's an example there, vegetarian menudo. No? So let's return to the spirit of uh, Philippine food, the original fusion food. We exchange recipes and spices and tastes. No? Uh, we adopted soy sauce, which is actually a Chinese vegetarian alternative to Southeast Asian fish sauce. And of course, we had ended up using both. No? And our diaspora means we are everywhere now no? with hybrid Filipinos of all kinds, hyphenated Filipinos. So shouldn't our foods be that way as well? No? Let's look for the niches there and heritage foods plant-based foods, halal, kosher. You know? uh, and maybe we might even see a reverse colonial mentality. You know? Suddenly we'll say, oh, popular it was America, you know? when of course it originally came from here. You know? It's a London or Paris. You know? Let's think global and act local. You know? Let's become literate about our own foods. You know? I worry about our food tech students who might not even know what certain vegetables look alike. You know? Or did they know that the one of the dishes served at the ASEAN State Banquet in 2017, 
uh, named the Malabar Spinach Salad. Here's a picture of it. It's actually alubati. So it sounds so different when it's called Malabar Spinach. Some of the other dishes there, uh, we have 15 minutes, so I won't go to Great Land. And their chef, Jesse, of course, and her team uh, that prepared the food for that Asian State Banquet. And there are the references. No? So let's start early. Let's get the food revolution uh, early in schools. No? I'm afraid our homes are too tradition bound, but in schools, we can encourage students to become innovative, adventurous, no? launch it at different levels, no? teach cooking in the early grades, and then go into scientific cooking, where you can actually teach biology, chemistry, and physics in a very interesting way because you're related to food. No? Uh, there's the Maki's famous book now explaining the science behind cooking. And of course, we can bring in the social sciences, arts and humanities, even your NSTP. There has to be a food element. It would make education so much more interesting. Here's an example at Halal Karinderia in Green Hills. I took a picture of their menu. They have rendang, which is like rendang. Uh, and there's badak and nokos and the others. And they're very good, and they're and they're quite uh, and and they're not expensive at all. I'm sorry, it's just jumpy. I'm almost through. So in the end, we talk about the diaspora. The diaspora will help to to make our foods popular internationally, but a lot of the impetus, the driving force, must come from the Philippines, including the Filipino hospitality that goes with it. Our calls to kainna and mangan, and we want to be cosmopolitan about it, you can always adopt. I know many Filipinos have adopted the term. No? It's a very short way of starting a meal in Japanese. No? Itadakimas, which means it combines a thanking of all creatures that contributed to the food. And also it's more than just let's eat. No? So I hope I got you not just hungry, but interested in the possibilities of going international. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Mike. Thank you, Doc Mike. It was, oh, I don't even know where by to the start. Way, by the way, if I may add, um, there's someone who makes um, something similar to a sriracha here in the Philippines. Mm. Um, I think it's under Basi Matsi. The, they made a, it's like a, a condiment using a home beer brewing process. Mm. I don't know how, I haven't tasted it yet. I don't know how similar it is to sriracha. Mm. Um, but yeah, they said, they told me that it is their version of sriracha. So mm -hmm. that's something to look forward to and try. Mm -hmm. I have a question, um, Dr. Mike. If you were to bottle a condiment of uh, Filipino cuisine, what would it be? Because, you know, you have uh, ketchup manis for Indonesians and you have sriracha as well. For How about for us? What do you think we should bottle? Well, I, I thought the tabon tabon one, if, if it would incorporate the the lime. I, I found the name of the lime and I forgot it again. <laughs> but it it uh, because it, it's the combination that makes it so good. No, and it will be different now because everyone already has soy sauce. And uh, I think the search should continue though, as as Ige pointed out, na ang daming mga regional cuisines. It's waiting to be discovered. No, and we might strike it well there. Na. Uh, you know, I, what I failed to mention earlier here is our fermented foods. No? The, the Korean kimchi is really a fermented food. And the health fads right now, fermented foods are really in demand. I think we just have to look for uh, one of our many fermented foods. Then. Not that the coco came from the Philippines. It, it's it's doing so well. No? We were not making it anymore. Yeah. The arburo, no? all the different kinds as well. No? So mm -hmm. it's just waiting. The foods are out there. People are eating them. But uh, we live in our own little worlds. So we really have to go out and find out what's there. Yeah. yeah. I think um, I've, I've done a couple of talks also about the promotion of Filipino food. And one thing I got from all those talks is that, first of all, we should stop being apologetic about our food. Mm, yeah. Right? Let, let, let us appreciate it for what it is. Mm. And stop comparing it to the other cuisines because that's what makes our food original. It's mixed of different influences. So yeah. let's embrace it for what it is. Right. Yeah. I never apologize for bagong. I think it has a place on the table all the time. <laughs> or pin or pinakurat as well. Like I think mm -mm. that's a, something very special. But um 
that, thank you, Dr. Mike. There's so much that so many ingredients that we don't know. I, I think it's for we have a lot of uh, young aspiring chefs here uh, who are just starting their culinary education, and I think they have so much to do. Like, don't get stuck in the school. Go to the market, ask people, like, and play around with the ingredients because mm -hmm. what you get in school is just going to be. It's it, you're not gonna find unique ingredients if mm. you're just to stay in your box. Mm -hmm. Talk to the suppliers or to the producers. You learn a lot from them. Talk to them about the whole process. Even going to the market, right? I know there's a young chef. Um, oh my God, I think Angela, you've written about him, but he goes to the market a lot to just discover for his tasting menus. And I think a lot of the young chefs or aspiring chefs should start doing that. Just go mm. and see what's out there. Mm. Mm. So what's nice also is that a lot of young chefs now are into foraging. So we're discovering a lot more ingredients now because of them. But yeah, mm -mm. but they have to get into the market. Eh? You get posted. Uh, Palapa, you know, ritual, ritual .ph also has it. But how many people know this? Mm. Yeah, and if they do discover it, I think they're just going to keep buying. <laughs> That's why I enjoy these talks that we give because like, although it's like information overload, if you could just take one to five things out of this talk is like, mm -hmm. it would really improve the way you approach food and um, cooking as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Very, very Thank much. Thank you. Um, okay, so for our uh, next speaker, actually, uh, Nicole Conseca, she's just going through some um, technical difficulties. So we will have to reschedule her for, um, for the next event, uh, probably next week. So if I can, um, we'll jump into the Q&A. And if I can ask uh, Dr. Mike and as well as Ige Ramos to join the virtual floor, and we will jump into Q&A. So if you guys have questions for our speakers, again, please just post them in the chat box. Um, if you allow me, if I get here, if you allow me yeah. um, to ask the first question, I'd like to ask again and, and Doc, Doc Mike, what do you think is the best, um, best way to promote Filipino cuisine abroad? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to get your two cents. I've asked a lot of chefs about this. So Ready, but I'd like to get your two cents. Mm -hmm. Mike, first, you're, you, you discussed it earlier in your presentation. So what are your thoughts about it? Yeah. Uh, what, what, I, I did mention you know, how, how Sun Head of 1617 was, was such a popular... It, you, like when I brought my Dutch friends there from the university, you know, it, it became so popular that they decided... To, to put all their guests in 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 that B and B, you know, and it was not just because the not just because of the rooms, but because of the food that was being offered, and it it was fusion food, and and this really goes a long way. You, when you talk with foreigners, but they, they'll say, "Oh, are you from the Philippines?" and then and then they'll always refer to food, right? And they'll say, "Oh, you know, I got to taste adobo. We had a neighbor with." or my ex-wife, or my ex-husband. Uh, those are the things that stick in their minds. And that is what is propagating uh, Filipino foods. No? Here, the problem uh, is not too many Filipinos are going into opening restaurants. And so, so that one, I don't know if Ige has some ideas. Na, uh, maybe, maybe we do go into packaged foods and that they make it into eBay and I mean we have to look for some of the more upmarket um, outlets as well. No? Again, it's branding. Uh, I, I don't buy, for instance, my tea now. No? I love tea, but I don't get it from from Chinese suppliers because I don't trust them. <laughs> you know, I walked in once into a tea place here in Quezon City, no, and mainland Chinese. And I talked with him no? in Chinese, no? and then you know he whispered to me. Don't buy the tea here. This is the it, this is the worst kind of tea. We sell it to milk tea, <laughs> milk tea outlets. No, milk tea is very bad tea. I have to tell you, it's the worst tea. It's it's lata. No? It's the, the the ones that they want to throw away. No? so ironically, I'm buying from uh, an American outlet, no? but it's so funny because when it comes in, it it's sent from China. No? So so they're really in China, but they have someone in the states. 
uh, giving the branding and all of that, no, and the packaging and the designs and all. No? So uh, it, it's waiting. No? We, we just need some entrepreneurs there besides the restaurants now to, to explore the internet uh, marketing, net, marketing networks. No? And of course, it has to go with books. It has to go with, <laughs> it has to go with, I guess, right. books. But it has to go with all the other things that we produce together with, uh, with, uh, the, the, the cooking utensils, no? that, that's something we have to, um, it's, it's not being talked about as well. No? Mm-hmm. I, I was just looking through Shopee, Kanina. I love Tempe Casino. I don't know why it never clicked here. No? And for some reason, I always buy them ready-made. And I said, ano kaya itong Shopee na? And you know, I actually found that they have the Tempe starter. No? They have it. They also have it for natto, the, the Japanese soybean things. So, so you can get it on, in shopping. So why can't we have in the future some of the um, other stuff that, that's harder to get? But people will remember that. No? They'll remember. I don't want to play an exoticism, but it's not. But I'd rather we have that exoticism for our tabon-tabon rather than for balut, right? It's it's you know, I never forgot that what was the name of that reality show no? and and of course they re- yeah and they yeah. Re- they renamed it they called it fetal egg something <laughs> fetal duck egg pala yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. which is really important yeah anyway maybe yeah. yeah um yeah um it's very interesting to see how we eat no so um there's a gap in um well I traveled to to the UK to yeah. Europe and to um, and I see the problem. I actually uh, there's there's a real gap, no. So maybe it's very very important. Uh, it's very very important to to uh, um, to acknowledge how do we eat our food? How do we serve it? Let's say, for instance. In in a no, like if you eat in, in a Japanese restaurant in the Philippines, you have different grades. You have the izakaya, you have the different, you know, like the the <clears throat> the the high the higher end. No, then like when like the French, for instance, they invented different grades of restaurants. Let's say, for instance, you have the bistro, you have the fine dining, you have. I think for Filipinos, we shouldn't just like put. Everything everything in one buffet style you know let's say for instance if there are like uh foreign entrepreneurs uh or or filipino entrepreneurs living abroad they have to narrow down the menu they have to narrow down the choices either they can you know like promote this uh, promote it as a regional cuisine um in fact uh, um, see, see Mam Annie, no, we were together in Lourdes, and we ha- we have we have a friend. She actually went to C- CCA. Um, she established uh, Asian Delis, no. It started as a food truck in Lourdes. It's the only Filipino restaurant in Lourdes. But um, and then uh, um, she really, parang parang nangyare, parang what do you want? Uh, how do you want your restaurant to be? Is it a fast food joint? Para bang Jollibee style? Is it a la carte? How do you cook it? Is it free frozen? So, I mean, as culinary uh, students, yung, yung, yung mga culinary graduates, they know already yung mga food technology. But then again, you have to put certain culture, certain business sense, mm-hmm. certain style, certain panache. Hindi yung parang... I mean, I have nothing against... Uh, like, I went to... Um, a particular place I won't mention in LA in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But I mean, okay, fine. It's Filipino food. Mm-hmm. It's buffet. It's like this. But but you know, like you you have to set a particular yung yung ano, no? yung, yung, who do you want to serve it to? Mm-hmm. Mga Filipinos then bus a daily city or sa Carson City sa LA mm-hmm. or in uh, the Pinoy in New Jersey or you want it or you want to open it to a new market. Mm-hmm. So basically, you can just have like a bistro style wherein you have like the basics. You don't have to go overboard. You don't have to put everything in a buffet, na halo-halo. But, you know, I think that's the way to promote Filipino food. Mm-hmm. There should be a segmentation. Mm-hmm. Then, then at the same time, 
it has to make money. Otherwise, parang advocacy na naman yan, parang NGO. I mean, it's deficit spending. Uh-huh. Diba? So, yun. Uh-huh. I don't know. <laughs> it makes sense because I think um, with Filipino food, if you are to put it in a buffet setup, uh, you don't have that ability to really give the people the experience. So, for example, eating tapa, tap, tapsilog, or the sinolog is a completely it's a it's a breakfast dish for a lot of us and that's an experience in itself um but i'm curious on the school aspect not just in a culinary school but high school grade school how should um they be approaching filipino food because i remember i had home economics class but i don't you know what else can we do to push that to so that the you know the the children are very curious about these ingredients Mm-hmm. Um, oh, mm-hmm. right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so again, well, I, I'll make sure first that all the schools have books like Naimas and Republic of Pace so that the students can go for reference. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I guess not paying me for this. Huh? And, and, and uh, I, I think we should, CCA should come up with a proposal on how we can offer offer the cooking at different levels nga, no? and mm-hmm. lesson plans and what can you include in it in here no otherwise they're just going to repeat the old home economics styles which are boring and not tasty at all i mean it's mm-hmm. the kids are going to say but i get this at home no? mm-hmm. uh, so i would like I, I would like to start especially yes they're the basics of cooking but if we can start off with our students sending them out and di- rediscovering what they have in their palenque, right? Mm-hmm. They might not even know that they that they have six or seven different types of bananas no? mm-hmm. because their moms are now buying Cavendish bananas. I think that's such a tragedy that people buy Cavendish bananas from supermarkets when foreigners come here to buy our senoritas and our uh, they have all kinds of different names, right? So just doing that, whether it is for a grade school subject or that's why I put their NSTP, you know, send students out to do as part of their NSTP a, a food heritage project. You know? mm-hmm. What are the spices that we use, the condiments, the all the different ingredients there? Because if they are the ones discovering it and documenting it, then they're part of it. They're stakeholders. They might discover that their own Lola pala has some, some secret recipe stashed away, some secret ingredient. Na, na, no? uh, a call pala to nanais, please talk with your sons about this. You know, during the pandemic, I, I, I had a sudden craving for, for some Chinese ingredients. And I realized my mother never told me where I could buy them. <laughs> She's long gone. Uh, yeah, they don't talk with sons because yeah, the mothers... You know, uh, so it, it's there and it's linking it up to all the things that you get talked about, no? the chromatic. I love that metaphor no? that cooking is like painting. No? And that will enliven the, the, everything. No? And, and it's a race against time because our, our young, our next generation is increasingly, their, their diets are homogenized. No? There's very little variety and it's all fast foods. You cannot expect that generation, if we don't break the mold, they're going to reproduce McDonald's. And, you know, it's, it's not what we want. You know? I wouldn't mind seeing a fast food version that starts to offer our own food, you know? but uh, I'm, I'm not too enthusiastic about that. But, but you know, to get them to, 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 to appreciate the wonders of, of uh, diets, not just in the Philippines, but, but also abroad. No? There, there's a book, I don't know if you've seen it, no? I, I recommend highly, it's called Neurogastronomy. No? It's been around for a few years. No? It talks about the neurology, the brain, how the brain shapes our eating. No? And one of the things that really terrified me is that uh, our palate, no? our taste seem to pretty much develop before the age of one. No? Uh, <sighs> In so many, put it another way, we destroy people's sense of taste before the age of one. Because right now, infant formulas, that's where all that craving for sweetness comes from. Infant formulas are very, very sweet. You should try them. And uh, that's why 
they can't appreciate appreciate the nuances of taste that we have. No? Uh, so there's a lot that has to be done. Maybe the last thing that I want to mention too is linking it up to, this is from Dr. Cesc Akuin, who, who was once the head of FNRI and, and she's a physician and nutritionist. And, uh, she says, don't forget, we have to develop our agriculture. No? And that students have to see as well, the, the concept of the farm to table is a, certainly something we should push in schools. Mm -hmm so that the students know where their foods come from. Um, my children studied in prog this progressive school na, where they were actually brought out to look at farmers no, to see how rice is planted and all. And they never forgot that. And they, they appreciate food much better because they've seen it no, and they know what the different type varieties of rice are. So, ang daming gagawin dito. Ang daming kailangan gawin ng CCA. <laughs> and of course, uh, just all add, the other schools will come in. Just to add to the Ije, Ije. Ije. Ah, Before we continue, I'd just like to acknowledge the presence of Congressman Tof de Venezia. Oh, there he is. Good morning. Hello. Hi, Tom. Good morning. 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 Driving. Yes. Background. <laughs> no, I just wanted to add what uh, uh, Mike said earlier. Because uh, like now in, in public schools, you have um, <clears throat> like in K-12, you have the 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 mother tongue, right? Mm. So you you learn uh, you learn you learn language. Parang you learn uh, you you learn from uh, you learn basic concepts like the uh, uh, educational concepts in your own mother tongue. Mm. You know? And 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 I actually discussed that in Dila at Bandila, ang paghahanap sa pambansan lang ng Pilipino. And um, the the importance of mother tongue and the importance of the importance of mother tongue and and how we taste it one and the same kasi nata transfer yung ano eh, yung, yung yung food consciousness mo if you eat local food and then you speak the mother tongue let's say for instance i grew up speaking chabacano and tagalog and i i i eat caviteño food and that that particular, uh, no, that, that particular uh, knowledge is embedded in my DNA, and I'm, I'm able to articulate this knowledge later in my life when I became a food writer late in life. I wasn't a, a writer earlier. I was like a designer, more visual. And now, parang yung importance ng taste and acquiring taste. Mm -hmm. And yun nga, no, yung, yung infant formula, if you grew up... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, drinking um, infant formula, it's really, really awful, no? Breast milk is still best for babies, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and these things are very, very important. Like, we really have to go on the level of, of zero knowledge. And then at the same time, ano ba yung ano, no? So you're an anthropologist, Mike, no? So, so um, when we, parang, ang nakikita ko ngayon is... Um, uh, uh, a lot of people, because, you know, like gr growing up in the 80s or in the 70s, lahat tayo, like we have all this colonial baggage. Like I love everything American, uh, American pop culture. And we all grew that, uh, grew up with that. Ganun din ngayon, no? like uh, uh, Korea has a very, very strong uh, pop culture. And it's all over. I mean, I see it everywhere, you know, from cosmetics to food. To, to lifestyle, to music. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, most young people, I mean, that's part of the rebellion. But essentially, but um, uh, I think it's very important for them to understand also the culture where they, they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Lang, no? So uh, we can really start with CCA and, and make it really sexy and make it really desirable to learn what Filipino food is all about. Um, there should be like a beautiful package that, you know, because like, like when we say Filipino or Filipino food, Filipino art or Filipino product, it's always geared to the to that particular school of design called La Wiswis Kawayan or the Vario Fiesta. Mm. I mean, we're beyond that. Kasi hindi lang naman Lois Wiskawayan School of Design tayo meron or, or the, the tinikling and done. I mean, culture is a very, very, 
you know, uh, culture is something you do without thinking about it, di ba? So, so that's why I like what ritual is doing. Um, it's it's less less burloloy mm. and and really sticking to the, you know, let, let's say for instance, so when we did the first culinary book, we did the way with the tinalak placemat, with the palayok, with the, with the sandok. And this was like really, really groundbreaking when, when Nilo Shima did the, the photos for Culinaria and, and Cloud Tayag styled it. I said, let's just use white plates. And then somebody asked me, uh, paano natin malalaman na Filipino yung, ano, yung food? Well, because of the ingredients. You, can, you will recognize sinigang when it's on a white bowl. Or you can, you know, so... So you know, so so you you really have to to really look at culture, make it accessible, make it sexy, make it desirable. Mm-hmm. Yun lang naman yun eh. Um, okay, Actually, Kong Kong Toff, we have a question for you from Robert Lomboy. Yes. Uh-oh. Can you hear us? Sorry, can I be yes. heard? Yeah. It's... Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, so I his just, question I just is, my is answer it, in the chat. I saw it. For sure that <laughs> that heard. It. Yeah, but siguro uh, aside from what I uh, aside from what I typed in the chat, um one program that we have actually already funded through the NCC and is ongoing right now is our roadmap uh, of the gastronomy sector. So uh, we're working with consultants um to be able to you know, uh, you know, gather some data, consult with the stakeholders, and then put in place the necessarily the necessary um, intervention. Hello. Mm-hmm. So then, up the industry scale into how an exhaustive three-part they did a few months ago, and we've distilled by that into specific uh, legislative. Ige also suggested that, but then there are many more interventions that we have her bill. Um, established, like, um, you know, cultural or heritage asset that we have is already in the pipeline. I think it was passed in the committee. So, I mean, that I think addresses the whole concept of uh, terwa, the pride of place, and how we want to be able to further strengthen the, the brand of like all these indigenous ingredients that we have here in the country. And uh, actually, there, there's so much that needs to be done for the sector. But I'm just happy now. Now, finally, we were able to gather everybody and uh, uh, come up with specific like mga action steps that hopefully through uh, funding in the budget, uh, we can empower the DOT or the DTI or the NCCA um, to implement these programs. And then also on the legislative level, how to institutionalize these programs um, so that uh, we're able to really grow the sector. Uh, so one thing that another thing that I wanted to add is that um, yung Samar, as we discovered in the committee hearings, see si, uh, then governor, current congresswoman Shari Antan conducted a Kitchens of the North, uh, Kitchens of Samar program rather. So parang they were able to take stock of their culinary heritage and then develop the necessary programs uh, that are tourism centric and also culture centric to be able to you know, um, activate these resources that, of course, leads towards the sustainability of their community and then also how the community can be more known um, nationally and internationally. So um, we also want to be able to replicate that model in other parts of the country. And uh, to add to that, we also want to uh, create the database of, um, of ingredients because as we found out, from our gastronomes and chefs, uh, usually there's like a supply problem. And so um, 
parang they are able to make all these amazing dishes but then they're lacking ingredients and then um, parang they're parang the value chain is broken so we need to sort of fix all those kinks so that the 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 gastronomy sector and the local communities become more sustainable and self-sustaining Thanks, Congressman. Well, one thing I, I love about this industry is that everyone's very generous with their time and effort. So if you need help with any of your projects, I'm sure we're all willing to help you in any way or form. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Kong. So uh, may I actually move on to the next? Yes, yes. So um, I guess we'll we'll uh, go and do the awarding of Certificate of Appreciation by Dr. Maria Veritas F. Luna. Um, Dr. Luna, may I call you on the stage, please? Hello. Good afternoon. It's already 1230. Mm -hmm. So we would like to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our very generous speakers this morning, starting off with Congressman Christopher de Venetia, in grateful recognition for your invaluable contribution as a keynote speaker to this event and uh, talking about Filipino gastronomy and heritage policy. So given this date, November 18, 2021, signed Chancellor for Education, yours truly, and our CEO, Marinella G. Trinidad. So thank you very much, Kong. Kong Tof, nagda-drive pala kayo. No? Thank you for <laughs> raising our occasion. No? And then, uh, next very slide. Sorry, uh, we just launched our bike tourism in Pangasinan. Wow. We're inviting all of you to come here to bike and also to experience um, yeah. our local ingredients from west to east. Uh -oh. Yes, very nice. Yes, yeah, so biking now is the, the high thing to do. No? Okay. So thank you, uh -oh. uh, Congressman <laughs> Tof. Congratulations for the project. Yeah. And the next, we would like to award the Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Ige Ramos, no? Mr. Guillermo Bumbo, no? G. Ramos Jr. <laughs> no? In grateful recognition of your invaluable contribution, no? you did a very good job in sharing your um, thoughts about uh, gastronomy. So pride in our gastronomic uh, roots. Thank you very much. Given this 18th day of November, 2021, signed by yours truly and our uh, CEO, Marinella G. Trinidad. Thank you very much, Ige. We love your talk and sharing. Marami nagtatanong ng ano, number mo, <laughs> Ige. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Yes, the next, well, yes. yeah. So thank you so much for, for having me. The 20-minute talk is actually so parang... That's like two semesters of, ano, <laughs> yes. of astronomy. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much, Ige. Thank you. Thank you. The next we have uh, Dr. Mike Tan, Dr. Michael Tan, no, in grateful recognition for your invaluable contribution as speaker no, to talk about the role of Filipino diaspora on the promotion of culinary uh, heritage. So given this 18th day of November, 2021, Signed by yours truly, and of course, our CEO, Marinella G. Trinidad. Marami salamat, Doc Mike. Thank oh. you as well. Thank yeah, you. We, learned, we learned so many things from you today. Sure. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Bea and Angelo. Thank you. Thank you once again to our esteemed panel. Your words hold so much bearing, and I hope that you have inspired everyone in the forum at as it has personally inspired me. Okay, so this is something I've been lo looking forward to learning about, TCA Manila's Filipino Culinary Arts Program. So together, let's watch this video. Thank you. 
If I can just ask uh, Chef Jasper and Chef Curran to join us about this as they are very, very passionate about Filipino cuisine. Chef Jasper and Chef Curran, how are you both? Hi, Miss Bea. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Chef Curran. You're here. I know. <laughs> Where you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I miss in different you. rooms. Yeah. We're, we're, we're both here at school and we're on uh, different rooms. So... Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we're here to present to you what uh, CCA has been doing for the past uh, uh, months. Uh, we are developing what is called the Filipino Culinary Arts Program, or FCAP. So the program will be launched on November 18, which is today. Uh, so I would like to uh, uh, welcome everyone as we present this. So my, my name is Chef Jasper Bersosa. I am currently the Program Manager for CCA Manila. And together with me is uh, Chef Kerwin Fontanilla, one of our uh, distinguished faculty here at CCA. Hi, Chef Kerr, again. Hello. So, uh, what is the vision of this program? The vision is to what is the vision of this program is to fulfill culinary dreams in Filipino cuisine. So, as CCA being the pioneer and leader in the professional culinary arts program, we would uh, like to develop a program which is focusing on the Filipino culinary arts as a vocational and training education or training course. Next slide, please. For so the program outcome, well, this program envisions to generate young men and women who have excellent professional skills in culinary art, in Filipino culinary arts. At the end of this program, the students should be able to, number one, demonstrate a high respect and deep appreciation of Filipino cuisine and culinary heritage. So we learned a lot you know, today about Filipino cuisine and the Filipino heritage as well. Uh, the students will be able to demonstrate competencies based on the test and the guidelines in food safety, sanitation, knife skills, uh, Filipino cooking methods, food presentation, and techniques applied to Filipino cuisine. The students will be able also to prepare and cook a wide array of Filipino dishes using appropriate techniques and present Filipino dishes in appropriate ways utilizing international acceptable techniques as well. Next slide, please. Chef Kerr? Yeah, so uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. So for our Filipino uh, culinary arts program, we have um, a lot of things that we wanted to instill uh, with the students no, uh, or our prospective students. So one is identifying a variety of Filipino ingredients uh, used in traditional and modern Filipino cuisine. This is very important because, as we all know, usually what makes uh, a particular cuisine uh, have its own identity is the ingredients that are used. No? So aside from really the methods, it's really um, the ingredients that gives it identity. So uh, with our Filipino cuisine program, more or less, we wanted to, or, or we're going to teach you and uh, we're going to help you identify uh, the various local ingredients that are used in uh, our cuisine. And we're going to teach you also definitely to prepare a variety of Filipino dishes uh, using standardized recipes and techniques. Actually, it was very hard for us to choose what recipes we wanted to put in because there were a lot of really nice recipes, but we tried more or less to focus on the, the, the not so common ones no? because we always get to um, prepare uh, common, uh, our common table fair food at home. So we wanted to try these dishes that, that, uh, that needed some spotlight sana, no? because these are some dishes that if we don't give them proper spotlight, they will get lost in translation. So we wanted to focus on that as well. Um, of course, uh, we're going to, uh, incorporate also ways on how to present it in the classical way and in the modern way. So like there will be times where in the say we cook adobo and then we're going to present it, let's say in a palayo, uh, which is traditional. And then we're, we're going to also teach them um, how to present it in a modern way, in a more uh, modern and more malandi plating, so to speak. Okay. Um, uh, we're also going to evaluate, so after we cook these dishes, we're going to evaluate them um, as our instructors uh, and tell them and tell you guys what areas, if ever, need improvement on. And if ever uh, it's good enough, uh, we're also, we're also going to tell you that. So, syempre, along with these techniques, we're also going to um, ensure that it is cooked and prepared in accordance with the proper food safety and sanitation um, guidelines. And I think even more important than the actual cooking is also um, discussing and more or less um, sharing uh, the origin and history of these dishes because also for me, I think what what makes you want to cook this food or what makes you want to cook Filipino food for the world is not just having good recipes, eh, but rather knowing what is the origin behind it, why this is braised, why is 
this dish was invented, um, so on and so forth. So parang it's giving it, um, it's giving it care, it's giving it, uh, it's investing emotions in the dishes. So we're gonna try to instill that in you as well. And of course, um, how we can properly package it and maybe um, sell it, uh, depending on uh, the food establishment or the food business that you are in. On. Next slide, please. So the course features um, 20 days. It's, it's, it's technically a short but kind of long course. It's called a short course, but it's 20 days. And we try to pack um, a lot, as much as we can. Um, and it's going to be one hour lecture and six hours of um, hands-on learning uh, per day. And it's spread over uh, five months uh, with a total of 140 hours. Um, like with what I said earlier, it's, it includes an appreciation of Filipino gastronomy, cuisine, and heritage. Um, also, we're going to discuss uh, various ways on how you can prepare and cook food, uh, plate it in the modern and the classical way. It features more than 68 Filipino recipes from 17 regions of the country. And of course, we're going to try to calibrate your palate and we're going to train, we're going to try to train your palate in how to um, cook these foods properly or cook the Filipino food properly. And we're going to have what we call an ALP or field trips. No? And just to answer, I, I saw a question earlier. I've been itching to answer it. It was from um, si Ms. Serena. So si Ms. Serena was asking kasi, how do we cook and elevate Filipino food without it losing its, its tatak Filipino thing? And this program actually tries to aim um, in producing uh, dishes that are that can be it can be upscaled. It can be made into a more fancy manner. But um, also, it doesn't lose its identity. Actually, I also like the what uh, I also like the analogy earlier with the music. No, so parang it's like we try. We want to teach you how to play the basic happy birthday song first, and then once you master that basic happy birthday song, it's easier to add some rock components to it or some ballad components to it. Because if you don't know the basic piano piece or if you don't know the basic recipe and then you go straight to to modifying it it will lose its essence it's big it, it will lose its homage to the original recipe magiging panibagong recipe yan eh. so this course um aims in teaching you the base recipe so it's not really standardizing it um i know it's a it's really a it's really a controversial topic it's not really standardizing it but we're trying to teach you the basic recipe so it's easier for you to enhance it and to modify it uh, depending on your preference. So next course, please. Uh, sorry, next uh, next slide, please, rather. So again, uh, with our courses, there's going to be an introduction to the course. Uh, what makes Filipino cuisine uh, Filipino cuisine? Uh, we're going to have uh, a food map, a Filipino culinary heritage and food map. And of course, we're going to discuss and we're going to cook recipes from all of our regions, hence the 20-day uh, program. Uh, so there are going to be recipes from Luzon, Visayas, and uh, Mindanao. And then, of course, we're going to have a Filipino diaspora cuisine, which is more or less cuisine that is served um, in other countries. So what the Filipinos or what do the OFWs cook uh, in other countries? And what are preference of foreigners when it comes to our food? So that's it on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Chef Kerwin. So part of the program will be the instructors, of course. So, of course, the instructors will be Chef Kerwin, Will be part of the lead instructors for this, uh, and yours truly, uh, Chef Miguel Rino, one of our uh, distinguished uh, faculty as well here at CC, and Chef Saudel Rosario. So next slide, please. So you may enroll. Who, who may enroll? Individuals interested to learn Filipino cuisine and cooking, professionals, of course, uh, hobbyists, food enthusiasts, even K uh, twelve students, college and university students, and tech students. So admission requirements are at least K-11 level educational attainment, physically fit to engage in coursework. Next slide, please. So included in the supplies will be your chef's jacket, your skull cup, aprons, and course manual. So the intakes will be on January, May, and September. Weekend classes is 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. So if you have questions, you can contact me. Uh, my email address is, uh, is uh, flashed on the screen. Uh, you may also get in touch with us through talk to us at ccmanila.edu.ph. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Bea. Uh, Chef Angelo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. and congratulations, Chef.
Thank you. Thank you. You know what was running through my mind? All the books that have been mentioned already and also yours, Angela, your cookbook. I feel like these students need to go through all that, those books to have such a deep understanding. Yeah, you need to have a library. There's so many regional cookbooks mm -hmm. that you, you, you can include in your um, uh, library. Yeah. So we have finally reached the end of our event. May I again invite Ms. Marinela Trinidad to take the mic and give her closing message. Good afternoon. Ms. Marina. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I can't seem to turn on the video. I'm trying to. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think there's a problem with the video, but um, I'd just like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank our speakers, Congressman Toff de Venecia, Mr. Ige Ramos, and Dr. Mike Pan for sharing valuable insights on Filip Filipino gastronomy and cuisine. I'd also like to thank Angelo for making this kickoff event very engaging. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our former CCA colleagues, Dr. who were, who were there during the very uh, early days of CCA, Dr. Cora Gachalian, um, Ms. Rose Dapol, um, Ms. Tina Aquino, and Chef James Antolin. And of course, the CCA Manila team for putting together an event that opens conversation for Filipino food and its power to bring us together. I, and of course, I'd like to thank our guests for um, giving their attention and spending time with us today. I've always believed that to be a great culinarian or a great chef, you must always know your roots. And um, as it was mentioned before we learn other cuisines, we must master our own cuisine. And that journey does not have an ending. It's a lifelong journey to understand one's own cuisine. I hope you were all inspired as much I, as I was today and that we may study more, learn more, cook more, and ask more questions. We at CCA are very much inspired to do more. And as what Mr. Egueramos and Dr. Mike Tan said, maraming gagawin ng CCA. And I think we can only do that with all of your help and support. So thank you again for celebrating this journey with us for the last 25 years. We are very much humbled and we are looking forward to educating more people on Filipino gastronomy and cuisine. So I hope to see you in our other forthcoming um, events and um, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. If there's, okay, before... If there's, go, ahead. go ahead. I think if there's two takeaways from this, that there's really a lot to do. And number two, we have to make Filipino food sexy, which I personally like what Aga said. Yeah. <laughs> Before we officially end, allow me to invite all the participants to join the next three days of CCA Manila's anniversary celebration. There is storytelling through food on November 25, Thursday at 10 a.m., alumni cook-off on December 1, Wednesday at 2 p.m., and a culinary competition on December 2, Thursday at 8 a.m. You can still register to get access in the remaining three days of festivities. The registration link will be posted in the chat, in the chat box. And for the participants, please do not forget to fill out the feedback form as this will serve as your attendance. The feedback form link will also be found in the chat box. And then catch the day two program as uh, we also have a great lineup like today. Expected to share their stories are Ms. Nicey Arafiles of Oro Chocolate, Chef John Buenaventura from Holton Hotel and Resort in Dubai, the Entre Pinais in Australia, and Chef Angelo Guison a food content creator and CCA alumnus. And we'll also have Nicole Ponseca jump into this day too. So I just want to remind everyone that's registered for this event, you're already registered for all the days. And again, lastly, always stay in touch with us. You can follow us on social media at CCA Manila. We've got an e-library as well because um, we believe every chef or cook should read and a YouTube channel and then a podcast as well. So again, I thank you for going with us the last two and a half hours. It's a lot in the morning, but hopefully we were all woken up and here we have you can get a free access to inquire plus the digital version of the country's leading newspaper the philippine daily inquire i know angela you're right for for inquire and it offers exclusive stories books magazines local and asian newspapers so there is a qr qr code where you can avail of this offer so again i would like to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us today 
Thank you to everyone who joined us in today's kickoff event. And thank you to CCA Manila for inviting me and my heartfelt congratulations on your 25th anniversary. Cheers to another 25. This has been your host, Angela Comsky and... Bea as well. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Signing off. Thank you.